going on. Okay, this is the 81st Thought Leadership Webinar, 81st. We've been here since March, mostly on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, where we've been examining a topic of central interest to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is to critique today so we get a better type of security tomorrow. Uh, and thinking differently, generating ideas, providing other ways of interpreting what's going on. Um, and the topic today is one that's an ideal summary, I think, for 2020. We're reflecting on the year. What has been the security success stories and what have been the security failures? And once again, I've got a three uh, um, elite panel members uh, from different parts of the world, actually, once again, who are going to be giving their views on this topic. Uh, as is usual, we're going to be broadcasting, of course, live today, as you know, and a copy of this webinar will be available on the website tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to, as usual, in a second, invite our panellists to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'll then invite you to ask any questions and join the debate. Uh, um, and of course, don't forget, that is your chance to put questions using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll endeavour to incorporate them best we can. We've got a few questions in advance, which I want to incorporate as well. So without further ado, then let me ask my panel to introduce themselves. And let's go all the way over to Canada. And first, Dennis. Dennis, introduce yourself, please. Good morning, uh, folks. Uh, at least it is for me here. Uh, I'm Dennis Shep. I've got 40 years experience conducting and managing investigations uh, and providing professional development opportunities across the globe. So I'm very happy to be here to share some of uh, my experience and observations uh, in relation to today's topic. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, Dennis. And uh, back to the south coast of England in Brighton for Gloria. Hello, everybody, and thanks for inviting me. My name is Gloria Laycock. I'm Professor of Crime Science at UCL. Um, I spent about 30 years doing police research in the Home Office, and I've been at UCL for 20 years next year, so you can do the maths. Doing this, me, Gloria, 20 years, that went quick. Uh, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and to, uh, then to, to Ruth, Ruth uh, in England too. Ruth, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, uh, Ruth Hennig. I'm a deputy speaker in the House of Lords, a past chair of the Security Industry Authority. And for the past four years, I've been a non-executive chair of a security company that's based in Glasgow. Thank you very much indeed. Well, there's the panel once again, uh, um, uh, an elite panel. And of course, these three actually have all influenced me very much during my life. So it's a great to have them to reflect on 2020 with us. So as is usual, I'm going to ask each of them to make an opening statement, three minutes to hear their views and their ideas on this topic matter. So let's go first. Dennis, your opening statement, please. Absolutely. Uh, 2020, what can we say? We, let's call it uh, Annus Horribilis. And I think that term is <laughs> quite familiar with some of my UK colleagues. Um, and and uh, I'm going to quote a couple of uh, highlights that I came up with this week. Uh, one of them is from the United Nations uh, um, uh, Secretary General was quoted that COVID is going to cause an increase in uh, certain types of terrorist activities this year. We've already seen that as a result of COVID now, we've uh, uh, experienced an email campaign, for example, um, that was a disinformation campaign concerning the COVID vaccine. And it was anticipation of the delivery of the vaccine, which occurred for the first time this, uh, this last week. Uh, but that type of activity is going to uh, increase this year. Uh, we also have a Washington Post article that was just published in the last couple of weeks that uh, I found quite interesting that uh, was titled, More Americans Are Shoplifting, and it's basically food to feed themselves. What we've experienced in uh, the U.S. is a 45% increase from 2019 of uh, 54, an estimated 54 million people that are uh, struggling with hunger as a result of COVID-19. But let's look at some of the more positive things that have probably uh, occurred that I, I can uh, uh, make as an observation. Um, we've had some uh, very interesting collaboration. Uh, examples of that come through professional development, such as events such as this. Um, and uh, there's been a significant increase, which has made the world grow a lot smaller. And it's uh, created more opportunities for for our practitioners and professionals in the industry to learn uh, more easily. Um, the, uh, the Zoom boom has created more opportunities uh, to learn and collaborate. Um, I just heard about an incident, uh, a colleague in Peru, uh, pardon me, Chile, yesterday was uh, commenting on the difficulties of conducting workplace interviews 
um, long distance and uh, using uh, these tools such as Zoom and, and uh, long distance uh, communication. Uh, what are we gonna look forward to? Uh, we've now got into vaccine delivery uh, situations. What about organized crime? What about uh, the gray market that might exist? Uh, fraudulent benefit claims. Canada's government was quite generous uh, at the beginning of COVID, and there's uh, quite a few uh, claimants that have uh, uh, received significant funds, and there's been allegations that there's a significant amount of fraud that could be involved in that. And uh, we, that we're going to uh, probably look forward to some overworked healthcare workers, uh, the uh, subsequent issues that will result from that, substance abuse, workplace violence. Um, and just the overall COVID distraction. It's distracted everyone in the field from their normal duties. And uh, what's going to happen with, with some of those uh, regular responsibilities? Just some initial thoughts, Martin. Fantastic. Dennis, thank you very much indeed. Some really good thoughts there. And of course, we'll come back to those in a sec. Uh, Gloria, uh, your opening statement, please. My opening statement, right. What went well, the good bit? Well, the good bit is it could have been worse. Um, the security sector, I think, worked well, although nobody seems to have noticed particularly. And another, I think, good thing, surprisingly, is that it's a massive disruption to the status quo. So it provides a huge opportunity for a complete rethink on how we work, um, what some are calling the new normal. I think the danger of that is that we just drift back. There's a huge amount of inertia in systems, but it's a massive opportunity to do things differently. What was bad? Well, we were not prepared. Not enough PPE, including for those in the security sector. The just-in-time supply chain too often missed the boat. And for us in the UK, I'm afraid it's going to get a lot worse with Brexit. Large agencies can't move as quickly as a virus. So we really need to be flexible. What I really want to concentrate on in my remaining 30 seconds or whatever it is, Martin, other lessons. First of all, in, in 2020, the bad guy has been a virus and man guarding doesn't work. You can't catch them and put them in prison. And I think this means we've got to think quite differently about how we deliver safety and security. We know there will be more pandemics, there'll be more natural disasters, there'll be more threats to our well being. So we need to be able to move quickly and flexibly. And in that respect, I think small is beautiful. Let me talk a little bit about the future, to thinking, taking those lessons forward. And I want to encourage you to think like Sir Ken Robinson, who's an educator and who sadly died earlier this year. He was very keen on creativity and innovation. And if you Google his TED talk, this 2006 TED talk, it's been seen by 68 million people. And what he says is, what if? What if we aim for well-being instead of security? We get rid of the negative and we talk more positively. What if security guards became safety officers? Security guards have something of a fortress air about them. Safety officers are concerned with well being. What if the public and private sectors work together? What if data on problems were shared across the industry and with the police? What if joint solutions were sought? What if every large company had a safety person on their board pushing resilience up the agenda? And finally, a bit of a bee in my bonnet, but what if there were more women at senior level? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very positive, very positive thoughts there. Okay, uh, thank you, Gloria. Um, let me just say to the audience, you get your questions in using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, as some have done already. We'll endeavour to get to you after Ruth has spoken. So, Ruth, your thoughts, please. Can I just ask you, Martin, can you see me because I've lost contact? Yes, we can see you perfectly. Oh, and okay, we can... I can't see anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it when I've given my three minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay, can I start with what I thought was the biggest failure? And, and to me, nothing showed up more clearly the lack of status of private security in March than when private security workers were not defined at the outset as being key workers. I, I was very shocked about that. I mean, the decision was reversed after a certain amount of lobbying led, I gather, by the SIA, but that shouldn't have been necessary. Uh, it showed to me that the perceptions of those in government at the beginning of the pandemic were that those in private security were not actually that important. 
Now, I actually think 10, year, 10 months later, that wouldn't happen again. I actually think private security personnel have established themselves in the course of the year as absolutely vital frontline workers. And to me, that's been one of the great successes of the year. Um, but as I say, I thought it started from a low point in March. I just wanted to make that point because there's always been this issue about the status of, of private security personnel. So let me get on to what I see as the big successes. First of all, there's been some fantastic frontline operatives and, and there's all sorts of stories about people on the front line who have become local heroes. Um, uh, you know, too many to mention, but, but, you know, let us not underestimate that in this pandemic, uh, there have been men and women out there on the front line who have been fantastically effective and have been really important for people's lives. My second um, important point is the use of technology. I do think that the private security industry has embraced technology, and I think this was mentioned in, in the first presentation, it's embraced it very well. And my example here is the provision of thermal screening equipment, which many uh, private security firms employed to uh, help, you know, uh, premises to take the body temperatures of people that were entering their building. Uh, but that's just one example of, I think, a whole very successful harnessing of technology by the industry. My third point is the resourcefulness of HR teams. I mean, the HR teams in private security companies have been absolutely on their toes. You know, premises have been locked down, they've been open, they've been locked down again, people have been on, on furlough, they haven't been on furlough, events have gone, no leisure activity, people having to be redeployed. So I really want to herald the success of HR teams and, and fourthly, the success of uh, mobilisation teams, because again, contracts have come, contracts have gone, <laughs> buildings have closed down, the contracts have changed and frontline mobilisation teams, again, there have been huge successes. And my fifth point actually echoes Gloria's last point, and that is, I think it's been a hugely successful 10 months for women in security. Whether on the front line or in HR teams or in mobilisation teams, women have played a really, really instrumental role. Partly, I think, because of remote working, which has given them more flexibility. But in keeping people safe, in roastering people, in being on the front line, whatever, I actually would like to give a great... Uh, three cheers to women in security because I think they've had an extremely uh, hard working and very effective 10 months. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Um, uh, okay, well, it's now, I'm going to fiddle around meanwhile, so just ignore me for a bit. Yeah, okay, well, we'll come to Gloria first, I think. Gloria, um, in some ways you outlined some some points there about about how it should be, and you, 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 um, you, you referenced the key. When I listened to that, I thought to myself, in a sense, it sounds obvious. Now, I know it doesn't happen. I know the point is that, you know, we could do this a lot better. What do you think the barrier is to, and I'm going to pick on a going by you, you and Grant here, and you and Grant, who's a regular contributor uh, uh, to these webinars, you and makes the point here that um, how do you judge whether private or public sector collaboration is doing, is doing well? And I suppose the point is, how, what's the, what's the barrier to this being successful? Public and private working together is not is, is no magical thing. People talk about it all the time. Yet most of the claims in these webinars have been over these, have uh, been in pockets of activity rather than you know high level strategic working together. What's the barrier, do you think, to that being successful or that working effectively? I think if you want successful partnerships to work, both parties or all parties have to agree on the aim of the partnership. And that's why I'm trying to change the, the focus from security to well-being and to try and take it away from the competitive making money kind of growing GDP kind of scenario to one where we're all working together to make the place a better place. We've got to do something about saving the planet. The virus is, is in a sense, the least of it. The planet's at risk. It is time we all started working together. Um, one of the great bees I have in my bonnet is the Data Protection Act or the latest version of it. It, it, it. You lose them, you know, what's the point of not sharing data when it means people can die because you didn't share data? You need to work together. And I think that won't happen until the overall aim is agreed between parties. So we need to work together and at very high strategic level, 
start talking to each other about what we're trying to deliver for the people. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that, I mean, again, it makes sort of perfect. It's, it's incredible, really. It doesn't exist at the moment, but it doesn't. Um, Dennis, I mean, I mean, of course, a similar situation, I think, in uh, in the in Canada. I mean, what do you think? Uh, um, building on what Gloria said, we lack a strategic direction here. Do you in Canada, or are there other explanations? Well, it's pretty regionalized. I'll say that is that um, uh, one of the things that uh, Gloria brought back to, to my mind was was uh, way before COVID's uh, situation. And uh, there, there was that increased uh, attempt to collaborate between private security and police that um, there, there was a, uh, um, a, a Canada-wide uh, uh, group put together of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. And what was quite interesting was a very significant representation was made by the police unions at that time. And uh, they were quite adversarial because they were taking the approach that it was impacting their jobs and that uh, manpower uh, membership was going to be lost because manpower would be cut back. And I think the struggle we all had on both the private security side and, and through uh, the police leadership was to try and, and, uh, and create more of a bond, as, as Gloria was saying. Let's have a common goal that's uh, a common enemy that we both, that all three of us can can uh, rally around and, and uh, the intent is not to uh, jeopardize jobs, it's to create efficiency and, and help the community overall. Now, I, I, I think it's still early because COVID is, um, still hasn't produced a lot of case studies here, is that um, I, I hadn't seen that happen as yet. Um, I think uh, Martin is aware that I uh, shared with a group just a couple of weeks ago that the Manitoba provincial government uh, announced uh, they're contracting with a uh, security firm to help enforce COVID rules. So it's still a bit early. I, did, I haven't seen anything that's a result of that as yet, positive or negative, but uh, we're, we're seeing that, uh, that there is that opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ruth, are you you back with us? We can yeah, see. Can I, yeah, can I just come in on, on yes preparedness? Yeah. I mean, in, the fact is, I think that we all need to recognise that the government was not prepared for this pandemic. It was prepared for a flu pandemic, but its estimate, if there was a pandemic um, of this ilk, was that about a hundred people would die. That was, although it was a tier one risk, it wasn't. It wasn't prepared for what actually happened, and I think that's quite important because that actually then sets the scene for everybody else to try and and and, and make some sense of this. And the government itself is not sharing data, of course, even with the local authorities. I mean, it wasn't sharing data when it came to all sorts of issues. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised if it's not sharing data with private partners. And I mean, on the PPE, again, the PPE equipment, it wasn't there. I mean, there was a tremendous shambles over PPE equipment. So I think we've got to accept that in the crisis, um, there were a lot of, 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 of government departments found wanting and, and against that background, it's against that background. I actually think private security did very well because it had to operate against that level of uncertainty. Yeah, and uh, this, this has cropped up on these webinars, I have to say, along the, along, along the way, where there's been uh, some sort of lament about that. Ruth, on this specific issue, and I'll come to Gloria on this after you, on this specific issue of working with the police. Now, this is something, of course, that um, you've had your You've been very close to over the years and there is this sense Ruth, even after all this time that this call to work together that Gloria's making and that uh, Dennis just uh, re-emphasized is undermined by the fact the police just don't get private security and mm -hmm. they don't see it as either professional despite the work that's been done as professional enough and a risk and a danger. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you agree that's a major barrier to progressing forward and how do we get round that on a strategic level? I think actually we have moved a step forward. I would now say the picture is very patchy. Some police forces and some officers do now value private security and do work with it. Others don't. So, I mean, I know it sounds strange to say that's a, a move forward, but it is because there are now, I think, uh, concentrations of, of personnel in the police who do value pub, uh, private security. The problem is that it's not across the board. It's, it's in, 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 in a number of police forces, but there are other police forces where, or individual police officers where it doesn't. And I'm afraid a lot of this is down to personnel. You, they've either come across people who are very, very good on the front line and that's then uh, uh, 
shape their view or they've come across people who aren't very good. And it's a tricky one, this, because people are influenced by their experiences. But I do think we're moving forward, albeit more slowly than one would like. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, because uh, it is possible to point to a more positive picture. But this, this, uh, um, this sort of call, we should all work together. Uh, in, in all honesty, uh, uh, Gloria, it's undermined, isn't it, by some of our state agencies just not getting it and not being on message. If they're not, we're on the run. Yeah, to some extent, I agree. I think one of the one of the major blocks to uh, the public and private sector working together comes down to trust. And I don't think the public sector trusts the private sector. I think they trust them. They, they mis distrust their motives. They think they're all in it for the money. And there's a sense in which that's true. Um, and that's why I want to change the focus. It's not about making money. It's about it's about delivering the community's well-being, and that should be something we can all sign up to. But it's a massive shift. It, it, it's got economic implications. It's got all sorts of implications. But if you can start to get the public and private sectors working together, and in in this field, it's a really it's a good good starting point because the security and safety is something we can all sign up to. There's a slight nuance about how we define these things but if we got them to work together more and we could learn to trust each other particularly if the public sector could learn to trust the private sector i think we could make quite a lot of progress yeah i mean uh, um, uh, dennis i mean this is a point that's coming through some of the questions simon chams put on uh, and simon contributes re regularly with his thoughts on these issues but but let's let's just deal with this so one of the main um, uh, uh, opportunities going forward, and it's worth dwelling on this, opportunities going forward, is to harness all that uh, uh, knowledge that exists in the community in different agencies. It's a, it's a no-brainer, it's easy to say and, and great words to understand. Um, um, and there is this issue of trust, and I know that's in Canada and, and other countries too. Um, can you see a way in which we can bring about some dramatic change in this uh, um, it's very interesting, uh, Gloria should say we've got a chance to rethink, which has clearly been happening. Uh, do you see pro progress on this issue over in Canada? Well, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to say is that the professional associations need to become uh, more active in this regard too. Is that uh, in Canada, ASIS International is probably the most representative organization of the uh, security professionals in our country. And um, uh, they've, they've done an admirable job. But I think there could be uh, more effort put towards um, bringing together at the local level, uh, get the chapters working even a little harder at getting uh, law enforcement um, to, to work a lot closer with, with the private sector. And how do you do that? You do that through um, partnerships and, and fostering. It's like any other kind of a partnership. How do you foster it? Is that uh, let's do a lot more things together that are non-threatening, that are that are opportunities to build that trust and 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 build some opportunities to become innovative and creative and and make both sides look like winners, uh, especially the public service side. If you can make if you can make them look better, and in these times of uh, talk of defunding and uh, the, the the complete public distrust uh, going towards law enforcement. I, I think they really appreciate that. And I think there's a role that uh, we can play in the private sector to help um, develop that so that it, um, they can see that we can be a, um, an enabler and help them out in that regard, a force multiplier. You see, uh, absolutely. I was just out of interest, uh, Dennis. I don't know whether you're with us on the 50th webinar we did, which is actually on the role of security associations. And uh, oh. one of the things that came through that, of course, they're in competition too. Uh, um, they're rivals, you know, it's, uh, um, so uh, and they're protective of what makes them special to their members. So uh, in a sense, we've got, um, it's difficult to see how you overcome that one, Dennis. No, I, I wasn't part of that. Sorry. I, I no, no, I'm just, it's, it's, but it's an issue though, isn't it? It's a, it's a problem. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I missed it. Yes, absolutely. Is that, uh, uh, you know, it takes work. It takes a lot of work. And uh, you know what? I've seen chapters evolve where you've got strong leadership and then all of a sudden you've got weaker leadership. And, and as a result, some of these initiatives, they fall behind. And, uh, and um, it, 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 you know, it's, it does start from the bottom up in a lot of ways too, you know, is that uh, in my chapter experience, that's where it started was the bottom up. We created uh, fabulous relationships with local law enforcement, but it was done through the chapter executive. 
um, uh, not having, not being afraid to knock on the door of a police chief and saying, uh, you know what, we'd like to have you come over for lunch one day and, um, and share your thoughts. And you know what, that, that developed into um, a, uh, a globally respected relationship. And, uh, and, and there's been a lot of case studies that came out of that. So, but it, you know, it, you know, it takes some effort. It really does take some effort. Yeah, okay. Ruth, um, good question to ask you. I mean, one of the big issues has been about the role of government. We've already sort of covered that on a strategic level. Do you think the, um, uh, uh, the issue of regulation has cropped up here? I mean, one of the, one of the big uh, um, things about COVID is that, of course, there's been opportunities there, and you yourself made the point that um, um, there's been some positive signs. It's a more trusted by government now. It's a key worker status. Um, do you think this is, could feed into a more uh, ambitious approach to regulation? Or is no, that, uh, it should have done, but it isn't. I mean, I'm afraid, you know, I don't want to be partisan, but I don't think this present government would see this as a field where they would be wanting to regulate. Having said that, and there is one good thing that I think has happened during the pandemic, uh, and it builds on something that, that, that Dennis just said, and that is that people have actually used the time to do a lot of online security learning and to take up more qualifications and we're seeing for example more certified security professionals emerging and, and the more we can show that the industry is professionalizing and, and is, is raising its standards the more I think it's going to be respected by government you know and then it's going to play its part so I think that is one good thing that's happened that, that people have actually taken time that they've gained through the pandemic to, to increase their qualifications. And Ruth, you mentioned earlier in your opening statement about the role of women has got, uh, uh, has yep. got, uh, um, um, uh, obviously that would be universally seen as a positive in a very male dominated uh, world. Um, um, do you sense that, and you mentioned the remote working, I just wasn't quite clear why, why in what way that has helped? Well, because uh, it's given much more flexibility. Actually the present arrangements enable women uh, to, 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 to do far more from home in terms of uh, organising the workplace, organising all sorts of things they couldn't actually do in that way before. I mean, you can now, you know, from your home, you can, you can uh, organise things the length and breadth of the country and beyond it in a way that just <laughs> wasn't thought about a year ago. So, I mean, Zoom and Teams and all these things have, have made a big, big difference. Okay. But, uh, but maybe I was, can I just say, maybe I was being coloured by the fact that I was looking at all the entries, the Women in Security Awards, which of course are going to take place in, uh, in a few months' time. But I mean, the range of, of activities that women are now engaged in right at the centre of security operations, not just in this country, but further afield as well, is actually incredibly impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, if that's a trend, then uh, it's to be welcomed. Um, Gloria, I, before I go to other questions, I want to just ask you about something you said that was really important, that, that um, in some ways offers a sort of different way of thinking about it, the word safety and well-being. Now, I, I get that, and I get the word safety. The problem with the word safety is that it's tied up with health and safety, which is a different sort of profession or a different world of expertise. Uh, um, and indeed one that in, in, in some ways uh, um, um, uh, gets in the way of security sometimes because that's regulated and so people are really concerned about it. Uh, um, that's the problem, isn't it? That the, the, the idea works, but the words around it are problematic or not. They are problematic. Actually, Martin, I spent ages trying to think of a word. Um, and I thought of oh, safety, uh, but the trouble is, uh, and I, I kind of favour well-being, but it's a very generic, you know, all-embracing kind of term. But I, I did, what I was trying to get away from was this image, it's an image problem. I mean, the, the private security industry has an image of manned guarding and oppression and negativity, and let's go and arrest people. The thing about the virus is you have to do prevention. You cannot arrest a virus. So it forces you to think differently. And I think that that's actually really helpful, but it, it, it doesn't go that extra step in trying to find a new word for security, which I, I do think is important because it's, it's got so many negative connotations. It's about playing on people's fear to get them to, to protect themselves from some threat. Whereas really it would be nice if the, the man who was standing at the doorway of the shop who is actually a security guard with had a soft 
softer image, his clothes, his demeanor, everything, saying, hello, I'm here to help. You seem to have set the alarm off. What a shame. Let me help you sort out the mess. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an attitudinal thing. And I yeah. don't know, you're quite right. I can't think of a word. There's lots of people listening to this. Perhaps they can all contribute. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the point's a good one, though, Ruth, right? The, the, to, to represent the image. And one of the big initiatives started in the UK, actually, part of the move to, towards that is to not use the word guard. Uh, because guard is in particular. The trouble with that is that uh, we had a webinar on this very on this very topic. Is around the world, guard is an established use, particularly in Africa. That's what they call it. And in Canada, I think uh, um, officer is um, the alternative word. Is is not allowed to be used for various reasons. But but anyway, look, this is a very healthy way to start. This is the idea of thought leadership. Keep thinking. I'm going to move on though. Um, Dennis, I'm going to come to you next. A very good question for you, actually. I um, mean, it's something uh, uh, that I think uh, we do need to reflect on as we come near to the end of 2020. Uh, and it's from Ifikta Rasul. And I'm so sorry I haven't, I haven't pronounced that right. I think I got it wrong last time as well. Uh, um, and the point is, right, we've been confronting the, uh, the pandemic now uh, um, over the best part of this year. Uh, um, a lot's been done in terms of developing a response strategy. Uh, do you think, uh, De uh, Dennis, that um, we are well prepared for a different one on a different time once this one was over. Do you think we've learned our lessons? Do you think we are, will be prepared next time around? Absolutely. Well, I've got a, you know what? Again, this is regionalized, but, but more so uh, globally in that um, I, I would say from Canada's perspective, we are going to be in a much better position the next go around because we, we've learned from it. We've learned the good things, the bad things. Um, We've um, we, we, we're in a horrible second uh, wave right now and, uh, and we're going to learn from it. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we're hoping that it can be all carried forward uh, as part of uh, resilience plans in the future. However, I've got to say is that my experience from listening to some experiences from around the world is that uh, that's not the case everywhere, is that there's still the, um, COVID deniers uh, at, a, at a governmental level in certain countries that uh, that say that they're uh, absolutely COVID free and have been uh, since uh, the spring. And, uh, and, and the fact remains that's just uh, disinformation. So, so um, uh, you know what, it, it is that it's gonna depend on where you live, uh, who you're governed by and, uh, and how much faith the governments have in allowing healthcare like they did in Canada, uh, the health professionals, the scientists uh, dictate where the, what was going to happen and uh, not politicize it. Ruth, can you be as positive? Well, <laughs> I'll start off by saying this, we all, we're always fighting the last war, aren't we? So as yeah. I said, the government was preparing for a flu pandemic, and it's actually yeah. got this one, okay? So we're now going to think in terms of being able to counter this pandemic the next time. Now, the next time I fear something <laughs> rather different will come along. Where I would be positive is I really do think that the industry is has become leaner, has become fitter, and become more flexible as a result of this. I do think the private security industry has learned a lot during this crisis. Um, it, it's winnowed out. I mean, I think some companies have been very successful, others less so, but it, people have learned a lot of skills. And to go, going back to my female point, by the way, which seems to have rung a few bells around the world, I mean, I have, I have no doubt that the flexibility of working arrangements and the way in which people are now organising their lives, that will have a big impact, and that will help all professionals, but I think it will help women professionals particularly. And that's, I think, a very, very positive thing. Yeah, okay, well, that, uh, well, I mean, uh, that would be that would be a positive result, wouldn't yeah. it, from uh, yeah. the, I mean, That would be a positive, one to, one, one to monitor and watch. Um, Gloria, a question for you that uh, comes in from Jai Yusuf, uh, um, who's emailed me from Nigeria. Um, um, and one of the big questions that's coming through is about, uh, the sorts of threats we face from here. Now you, uh, in your academic role at UCL, have been doing a series of short, very short papers, sort of summary briefings, is that what they call briefings? Yeah. Uh, about crimes and how it's being responded to and uh, the impact of the pandemic on those. Can you give us an insight, uh, um, uh, Gloria, into uh, what you're learning from that and where the big opportunities perhaps or gaps are in terms of the responses so far and going forward? I'll come back to my opening comments. I said COVID exposed our inability to anticipate problems and have plans in place to deal with them. And what we did with our COVID-19 series, which is available online, but we, we encouraged people, and you were one of them, Martin, to think about 
to try and anticipate the problems. And one of my colleagues, Nick Tilly, did one on fly tipping, just dumping rubbish. And he did it really early on. And he said, look, there'll be an increase in rubbish dumping because all the recycling centers are shut and people just throw their rubbish everywhere. And within two weeks, there was newspaper reports of rubbish being dumped all over the country. That was something that could have been anticipated, something that could have been planned for and it could have been dealt with. And that COVID series is, was an attempt by us to try and think ahead on a few things. Parcel theft was another one, people having their parcels stolen from the doorstep because everything's being delivered online, but, you know, um, by delivery and, and courier firms now. There were loads of them. And I think what, what we've got to get much better at is, at is anticipating things and planning for it as a consequence. And we do not do that at all well. One of the other things, very quickly, um, we've got at UCL is this, the Door Centre for Future Crime. And what that's doing is going around talking to engineers and technologists and computer scientists and saying, what are you doing? Because are there any crime implications for this? And if there are, how can we get ahead of the game and prevent things before they take off? The internet's been a disaster in that respect. The internet has been a massive crime generator and nobody anticipated it and nobody did anything about it. And still nobody's doing anything about it. So we've got to get better at those things. And the thing is, uh, um, Gloria, do you think academia, and maybe criminology in particular, but academia has reacted well in terms of thinking about what the crime prevention messages or headline issues are going forward? Has it served us well? Well, it's patchy. <laughs> That's what everybody's been saying. I'd like to think we, I'm being terribly biased here, as you'll appreciate, Martin. At UCL, that's what we do. I mean, the crime science is about making crime go down. It's not about thinking about it or um, mulling it over or ruminating about it. It's about doing something about it. And so we're naturally in that mode. Um, whether academe more generally has, I think some people have been incredibly good. Uh, the medical profession in particular, the epidemiologists and so on have responded incredibly quickly. But it's been really interesting from a science point of view. The government mantra is we're following the scientists. It took them a while to work out that scientists, science is, a, is, there's no cut and dried answer frequently in science. There's a debate and there's a probability attached to the kind of conclusions you can come to. And you can't prove your hypothesis. You can only disprove it. I think, I think that well, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not trying to make a political point here, but some of our politicians are colossally ignorant where science is concerned. And they don't understand science. And in the future, with threats like viruses and the, the natural disasters we're facing, they are going to have to learn how science works. Okay, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting point. Dennis, you're, you're not, I wonder whether I could just come to you though on, on this point. The you, you gave a very sort of positive view of how security has responded. And, uh, and of course, we can all point to examples. I wonder though, Dennis, I wonder whether this is just uh, this point that in a crisis, you'd expect security functions and companies to do well. That's what they're there for, perhaps. But we're about to go into a period of economic hardship. And we know when that happens, security suffers and gets cut back and uh, loses resources. Um, are we just not following a cycle that uh, rather than get carried away with how well it's done, we just better prepare for what's coming next because we know what's coming next, don't we? You know what, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Martin. Isn't that the truth? Is that over the years, it's been a cycle? Is that uh, will will shine? Uh, I would hope though, and I would call on uh, any any of the practitioners and professionals that are that are watching this today that have, have, that have some success stories write them down, publish them, share them. Don't be shy and don't be timid. I mean, we need that kind of information is, is that's probably one of the weaknesses uh, I was to try and get my hands on some, some valid, reliable case studies that showed that security was uh, a star during COVID. Um, but we need to see some more of those uh, out there and, and we need some more sharing. But you're right. Um, let's hope that uh, it does. Uh, that we learn from the past. We tend not to for some reason. But uh, let's hope. And uh, I agree. Let's let's try and hope that um, that we don't become a victim of uh, an economic downturn after this is all said and done. 
but that we leverage what we've learned. We've leveraged the successes. And, um, and you know what? Uh, one of the things I always ask people that attend a, a workshop of mine is I do a show of hands. How many of you are in sales? You only get a couple people, usually the ones that are selling systems that'll put their hands up. And I say, you're absolutely all wrong. You're all supposed to be in sales. If you're security professionals, you should be out there selling your programs, selling, selling what, your, what your mandate is, your objectives. And, and you, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to adopt more of those marketing skills and sell ourselves. Okay, Dave, Ruth, I'll come to you on this issue because it's, uh, it's a biggie. Uh, um, what next? Are you, are, you, are you optimistic for 2021 and where security sector is going to develop? Or do you fear that we're going to go back into, a, um, uh, we're going to go backwards because of the economic hardship that's likely to follow? No, I'm realistic, <laughs> almost realistic, very a bit pessimistic. Um, I mean, in the summer, a lot of security companies very sensibly were planning for a second wave. The second wave came and actually they were, were ready for it. A lot of them are now planning for a third wave and they're planning for exactly what you're talking about. As with every downturn, there are always upsides. I mean, one of the big issues for people in security 12 months ago was, would there be enough frontline labour available because with Britain leaving the uh, EU there was a big big issue about recruitment and whether there would be enough people. We're now as a country going to be facing quite significant unemployment and I hate to say this but that is actually from the security industry's point of view that might give opportunities for recruitment of the sort that we didn't even imagine might be there 12 months ago. So I, I, it swings and roundabouts. I'm realistic that I actually think that security is, is in a good position. I'm going to no further. It's in a good position at the moment. And I think it's preparing, and I think it's had a lot of uh, practice in, in how to uh, kind of, you know, deal with difficult situations. But it could be that something will come up in the future that we haven't anticipated. And I yeah. think we mustn't forget that. Okay, I'm going, Gloria, just a quick question for you, because we're running out of time. It's from Gordon Knight. Uh, and uh, um, of course, you're, as you said, Gloria, in terms of an academic role, you've been right at that, uh, that, that, that bridge between academic and practice. You've actually taken it as, which academics don't actually typically bother about influence in practice, but uh, that's where you've positioned yourself. Um, and Gordon Knight's point is, is, is it a struggle to get people to listen? Yes. It's <laughs> a good question. Take any notice of me. It is a struggle, um, and I've, I've learned I've learned a lot about how to do it. Just very quick anecdote: the reason car crime has dropped by nearly over eighty percent is because car manufacturers put deadlocks and immobilizers on all vehicles at the point of manufacture. They listened, and the only reason they listened is because we threatened to publish the car theft index and name the worst car worst designed cars. In other words, we've got to learn to use levers over the private sector. And I don't mean the security industry here. I mean, the people who cause the crime problems or, or contribute it to crime problems by making it so easy. Um, it's about learning to leverage action out of other people. And I really, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd love a bit more influence, but. Well, you've had quite a lot, Gloria. You've got to be fair, you've had quite a lot. It is. Um, listen, thank you very much indeed, uh, um, panel. We've running out. We've run out of time actually. But thank you so much for your insight. I have to say, I really enjoyed the uh, the, the the angles that you come at this from. And indeed, that's the idea of thought leader: throw up ideas, you know, and uh, think differently. And uh, um, certainly, we need to do. And I take your optimism, and I take your warnings. And uh, I'll put these in the blog tomorrow. I'll also include uh, Gloria reference to your uh, your series so that um, others can follow up. Uh, it's a, it's a good series, good way of thinking about it. Okay, uh, just a few summary, summary comments from me, uh, if I could, uh, just to uh, um, let you know that uh, um, the Outstanding Security Performance Awards 2021 is on us already. We start in South Africa, the Osprey's entries are open, and in Nigeria they're open. And stand by for more news on others that will open shortly. Uh, very quickly to say, there is a, um, a study going on on the effect of social media data on investigations and on prosecutions. Managing social media data, it's an enormous problem. We'd love your views, just 10 minutes. If you could go to the website and spare the 10 minutes to do so, we'd be very much appreciate your insights. Um, 
Just to let you know also that uh, uh, we'll be going on into the new year. We've done 81 so far. We're going to make 100, I'll tell you. And uh, we're back on January the 19th, Tuesday, January the 19th, when the topic is Enterprise Security Risk Management, the Holy Grail or a concept found wanting. And the same week, events, what events, how will security shows and exhibitions evolve in 2021? So we'll be going on into the new year. Uh, just a, a big thank you to all of you for your for your questions and your participation and the audience worldwide. Uh, um, it's been a, a great pleasure uh, engaging with you. Thank you very much indeed to the to the panelists today. Uh, very very good finish, I have to say. Thank you very much indeed to the three of you. Uh, a particular thank you, if you wouldn't mind, to uh, Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller in the background, to uh, the real stars of the show. Uh, um, and, you know, on the first 80, 80 webinars, I've always ended in the same way. So um, what I would like to do is to wish you all a season's greetings, um, a prosperous and happy and healthy new year, of course. And uh, as I said on the first 80, to, until we meet again, wherever you are in the world, stay safe.